Okay, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, all of you out there in uh, the remote areas can hear me. So can someone raise your hand? Can you hear me out there? Great. Oh, great, great. Well, good morning, good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Chaddock with the One Health Initiative in the, the College of Veterinary Medicine. But I certainly want to say this initiative is a campus-wide initiative. My house is in the College of Veterinary Medicine. But uh, Meredith Halib in the back there, Meredith and I work all over campus on the, on the One Health Initiative. So welcome everybody, those of you here live and those of you out there. <coughs> we're, we're very, very pleased today uh, to have a, a good friend and, a, and an expert with us today on, on One Health. And I know you're going to really, really enjoy uh, Dr. Mazette's talk here today. And uh, I want to certainly give you the formal introduction, but say a few words before that, that uh, Meredith and I and our team in, in our office last year uh, went out to University of California Davis and spent three days uh, visiting and seeing what they're doing in One Health and, and getting ideas and, and finding ways that we can collaborate with different universities. And certainly UC Davis is a collaborator and a friend and stepped right up and and the amount of time and effort and what they've put in in their One Health program in Davis is, is just amazing. And I know that uh, with Dr. Mazette being here today, you, you're just going to have the, the tip of the iceberg, of course, of what's going on in their program, but it'll give you some flavor. And, and it certainly gives me some aspirations on, on things that, that we want and are striving to do. And I, I picked uh, Dr. Mazette up at the airport last night. She came in, of course, on the last American flight, so you keep your fingers crossed. And that was supposed to be 9.40. Well, it was about an hour late, not too bad. But then it took almost an hour to unload the luggage. And let me tell you the rest of the story. She's stopping over here today. This is just kind of a stopover. She's on her way to Africa from here with laboratory things. <laughs> so, you know, we've got a lot of things in the car here today that are going from here back to the airport to, to go to Africa. So we're very fortunate that we have her here only for a few hours. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, we've got to get going because we've got to get her on this next flight out. So anyway, I, I, I'll uh, just tell you about Dr. Mazette. Uh, Dr. Mazette is a professor of epidemiology and disease ecology and the director of the One Health Institute in the University of California, Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, where she focuses on global health problem solving, especially for emerging infectious disease and conservation challenges. Dr. Mazette is active in international One Health research programs, especially disease transmission among wildlife, domestic animals, and people, and the ecological drivers for disease emergence. Currently, she is the principal investigator and co-director, <coughs> I gotta clear my throat next, of a $75 million viral emergence early warning project named PREDICT that is being developed with the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID Emerging Pandemic Threats Program. She has recently been elected to the National Academy's Institute of Medicine in recognition of her successful and innovative approach to emerging environmental and global health threats. So you can see why we wanted to bring Dr. Mazette here and, and why my aspirations are, are high. So, Jana, they're all yours. Thanks, Mike. Well, thanks for having me. You guys wave at somebody here if you can't hear me because that is going to be distracting because I can see me up there too. I, I just gave a talk to um, the Global Food Security, Food Safety Institute, and big, well, you know, Cargill and Coca-Cola and all these folks, and they had people tweeting on the screen while I was talking. Oh, that is very distracting. You know, well, I hate her. Get her off the stage. No, I didn't see any like that, but it was very distracting. I can't wear a mic because it has to be this one. So if you guys. Yeah, they said that one's not working, apparently. Can you guys hear okay? I feel like. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay, so. 
Um, Dr. Chaddock asked me to talk to you about bringing disciplines together. And um, the way we use One Health at Davis, it, and I know there's a lot going on in the One Health realm, and so some people will be sick of hearing that term. Why do we use it? We've been doing all this good work. Um, we don't need to label it. I, I'm, um, I'm fine with that. If that's your attitude, that's cool. I feel like I've been doing it for a couple of decades, and that's the approach that we use. I think it's great that there's a label that people can jump on now that brings more people into the fold for using this approach. So I like the name because my mom can understand what it means without me um, having to talk to her for an hour about epidemiology and ecosystems and why human and animals are connected. So it, it seems to have a um, very intuitive context about it. So I like the name, but I'm also really happy to have lots of disciplines and people involved who don't like the name. That's okay. I think we need to stop worrying about that and its definition too much and just do the good work, right? And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about a couple of things, mostly the one big thing, because everybody always wants to hear about the, if you come to academic circles, how do you get $75 million? So we can talk about that. I know some of you have that in the room, so you guys can give the next talk. Um, but, um, but anyway, we're, we'll talk a little bit about how we use One Health versus necessarily, um, you know, the the different controversies. But obligatorily, we need to show the Venn diagram because I know it's up on the wall in the One Health program office. And, um, and certainly, there are lots of different disciplines that can come together. And when we talk about it at Davis, an interesting thing happened is that we had a strategic planning session for, and now I'm speaking about the School of Veterinary Medicine. I'll talk about the other colleges and how they're interacting. But our School of Veterinary Medicine, about a year and a half ago, changed its mission to be advancing the health of animals, people, and the environment. Okay, and so what is that? That sounds, ooh, a lot like One Health. That was the faculty coming together to put together a new mission statement, and a lot of those people hated the name One Health and didn't want to talk about it. But then when they decided on the mission collectively, the mission sounded a lot like One Health. So I think that's great. But as a One Health Institute director, I thought maybe I was also out of a job. And so we needed to define how we use One Health within our One Health Institute. So our One Health Institute um, contains several centers, and one of the biggest centers is the Wildlife Health Center. And I was lucky enough to be the director of the Wildlife Health Center for about 15 years, and, um, and as well as my professorial duties and then building the One Health Institute. But, um, but we really use the One Health Institute more as an umbrella organization for some of the centers that fell within it. We also now, when we think about that mission, we think about what we do in the One Health Institute as being only in the center here. So when you think about One Health here at Texas A&M, I don't know how you apply it, but many places institutionally will say, well, we do canine models for human cancer, and that's part of our One Health program. We have a great program in that too. That doesn't fall within our One Health Institute. We think of that as a wonderful example of, of this kind of work, but when we're talking about what we do at the One Health Institute, we're talking about only when we're at the intersection of human, animal, and environmental health, where all those things need to be addressed or we can't solve the problem. And so some of those problems and drivers I've listed here, there's, there are more. But I know some people also get frustrated when we talk too much about zoonotic disease. So One Health is not just zoonotic disease, but I think it is where um, people can really get the meat on the bones. So I don't know if in any of your academic discussions you've talked about how this sounds all very airy-fairy, we'll all collaborate, and won't that be beautiful, and kumbaya, and maybe we'll bring some different disciplines together, but it tends to be more the human and animal medicine coming together and less of the other disciplines involved. That's what we see on the global scale. So we're trying to um, model best practices of what happens when you really do bring lots of different disciplines together and um, try to solve the problems in a little bit more holistic way? So this is one of the problems that helped give us a kickstart uh, in 
in um, One Health. We actually did in our uh, university a lot of other things, one of them being oil spill response. But if I could, yeah, that would be great. So this is an example of a watershed in California. This is actually um, the Elkhorn Slough watershed. But we have a couple of different watershed issues that involve both toxins and um, parasitic diseases and bacterial outflow, where folks immediately, when there's a problem, maybe it's impacting our shellfish industry, or it's impacting our dairy industry, or there's water quality that's shutting down the beaches, people tend to get angry and fight, right? And they get after each other. Well, it must be the cows. No, it must be the sewage plant. No, it must be. And so this is where One Health can be very, very useful. So in this example, in Elkhorn Slough, we had uh, dairies and power plants and endangered and threatened marine mammals, as well as birds and fish and endangered wetlands. And so we um, definitely had the issue w when it came to play that our shellfish industry was having trouble in the region. Um, and what can get people's interest the most is when you have something cute and furry and iconic that gets sick and starts dying. And so I think Dr. Conrad, Pat Conrad from UC Davis was out last year, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on our sea otter story, but I do want you to know that because of the sea otter, really more than even closing shellfish and closing beaches, we were able to attack a One Health problem. And guess what? Everybody could get behind that, okay? So nobody wanted to say, I want to go kill the sea otter, okay? Well, there are a few fishermen. We won't talk about that. So, um, but we, they're on board as well. Um, and so when we were able to find a flagship species with a flagship problem, so we did identify Toxoplasma gondii as one of the big problems, we were able to go back and look at the whole ecosystem and see how that was moving. We were able to link that actually to climate change and show that a combination of different land use, basically from 2000 to 2010, the change in land use and paving and making impervious surfaces so that there was a huge influx of uh, water, storm water, into a system at the same time as huge precipitation increases with climate variability was resulting in a whole change in our ecosystem. And so that has resulted in people looking at different land use practices, different ways to um, actually um, put the marsh back into its own um, restored order. Uh, because the marsh was acting as a great filter. So this project where really in the beginning a few wildlife veterinarians like me and some epidemiologists um, together working with the biologists that cared about the sea otters found a problem, we were able to in fact take that problem and make it outreach to different disciplines. So oceanographers, like I said, community planners, all sorts of folks coming together to help save the sea otter. Now, they have less toxo now. Whether or not that has anything to do with what we did, I don't know. But the end product is that we have a healthier system, and it's on the road to even healthier system. So today I'm going to talk to you a bit more about um, a different kind of spillover. So we, we looked at that as a spillover of land pathogens into the sea and how that can really be dramatic when you introduce a new disease or a new pathogen into a system like toxoplasma. Today I want to talk to you a little bit more about our USAID PREDICT project. Um, and that's where we are um, looking at this big challenge. So USAID said we want to find somebody who can help us stop Ebola and HIV and SARS before we know what they are. And actually today our teams are responding right now to an Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone and Guinea. So um, these things are happening all the time. Sometimes they make it to our news. If you read ProMed every morning, you know a lot more than if, um, than if you don't. But sometimes they go completely undiagnosed. And I wonder here, how many of you have ever suffered from an undiagnosed illness? You were sick and you just got better. Thankfully, you got better because you're here. And, and, no, and, and anybody, when they were sick, get, end up going to a kind of a discipline that wasn't maybe your own? So how many, how many human health practitioners do we have in the room? <laughs> what happened? Okay, how many animal health practitioners do we have in the room? Okay, how many engineers? Yes. 
So engineering always represents in one health. So I'm very happy. I'm sorry that you're the minority, but I think that's awesome. How about other disciplines? What else do we've got? Well, get, throw them out there. Mi microbiology, pa pathology, both human and animal, or yeah? Comparative pathology. Okay, how many comparative researchers or scientists do we have or practitioners? Okay, pretty good. I'd count myself in that too. Yeah, sure. All right, what else? What are we missing? What disciplines are here that might we might not think of all the time? Pharmacy. Sorry? Technology. Technology. Social scientists. How many? Just one? We, no, no. Pharmacy. Oh, we're missing. You're, yes, <laughs> you are and we're missing them. Okay, so we'll, slightly, yeah? Management. Management, cool, good, important. All right, so when we think about how we're going to preempt or combat the first stages of emergence of a zoonotic disease that we don't even know what it is, we need a lot of these disciplines to come together because it's not so much about, I know Ebola is here and maybe it's spreading there, and oh, by the way, Ebola is probably not gonna go pandemic, right? Because why? You get too sick before you could get on a plane and move around, so you get sick and you die, frankly, so it burns out pretty quickly. So we want to know about the ones like what? Like MERS coronavirus, right? The new ones. The ones that take a little while, their incubation period is such, we don't know where it's coming from or how we get it. Those are the ones we want to identify ahead of time. Well, we need to think about that. We need to think about socially, religiously, how people come together for the Hajj. We need to think about what kind of environmental systems are put together so that they can be healthy while they're there, sanitary systems, all of those things. We need to think about how they're going to get health care. We need to think about what they're going to eat and how many animals hundreds of thousands of animals that are brought in to feed them from other countries and what that traffic pattern is, not just the human migration for the Hajj, but the animal migration for the Hajj. Where do those camels come from? Oh, by the way, most of those camels that they keep as pets are bred in Africa in, in lower latitudes than, um, than where they're coming from there. So there's so many things to think about that we can't all be so smart as to solve these problems. And that's, I think, why... Um, one Health is really useful in the academic environment because at a great university like this, you have those disciplines. They are available to you, or you now are so globally connected, we can go out and get them. But you have the opportunity to get out of your laboratory where you're doing good basic research, but also collaborate and translate that into some global solutions. So we bit and took on this challenge, and um, it was very scary, but the reason why a originally a wildlife veterinarian turned epidemiologist and now somewhat comparative practitioner in health, um, is talking to you about this is because these, the majority of these emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. And we can talk, like I said, for One Health about lots of different things, but this one's easier. It's frankly just easier to talk about zoonotic disease and how we get together to solve that. And human activities at interfaces with animals are linked to almost all actually all except for antibiotic resistant um, at new emerging infectious diseases. And then we need to figure out what kind of science do we need and who's been missing and how to bring them in and bring them together to address these problems. And when we do that, when we look retrospectively and look at where disease has come from and when it's emerged for the first time, what drivers do we see? Well, we see land use change, markets and trade, migration and conflict, resource extraction, water and food security, and global transportation as rising to the top of those things that drive the emergence of disease. Well, there are also things that drive our general health and happiness, right? And many of them are an effect of us going after more resources or living a nicer life. And so those things are things that in academia we should come together to address. We probably are in any case, whether we're talking about zoonotic disease or something else. When we do talk about zoonotic disease as an example, here's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about, um, actually I'm gonna focus on viruses today, but we're talking about viruses that are probably cycling in hosts where they may be the endemic virus for that, that um, species. But it's when it spills over, it could spill over to another wildlife species, it could spill over to a um, 
domestic species or directly into humans, that's when we notice it. Because when we're spilling over into a naive population or a susceptible population, we start to see it and we can get amplification and spread. And we call this host plasticity. When, the, when a virus can infect multiple hosts, that's one of the major factors we think about when we think about whether or not a virus has pandemic potential. Is that if it is able to infect multiple hosts and cause diseases in some of those hosts that it infects. So what do we do if we want to basically most of the big funding is to stop this or to limit this, but we need it for this so that we're, we can be healthy and um, enjoy our pets and our food. Um, and many of us care deeply about what's going on with global biodiversity as well. So how do we attack that? Because right now, those of you who raised your ar arms about having an, an, an undiagnosed disease, I had one too. Two weeks in the hospital, 104 fever, couldn't get the fever down. They basically just said, you're in grave condition. We don't know what to do, right? Or every day, well, tomorrow you'll be yellow because we're sure you have hepatitis even though all your hepatitis tests are negative and you're not yellow. So, um, so that's a bad deal. And, and why is that? That's because we don't have diagnostic tests for things that haven't emerged yet, right? That, how do you do that? Well, that was our first challenge. How do you do that? If I can't even know what's circulating here, how do I know what to watch for here? And if it does spill over and cause disease, I can do pathology. That's the ultimate. We want to identify a pathogen in a tissue that's affected, but if we don't have pathological capacity for these species, let alone these species, in most places of the world and in places where we think retrospectively we've looked and we think that we know where these things might emerge based on history, there's really very little pathology that's done because of a lot of taboos. So people are not autopsied, let alone animals necropsied. And in mo many places of the world where we're still working, people are told if your animal's getting sick, better eat it now. Kill it now and eat it. That's the best thing you can do, right? You don't want to lose your money, right? So have a feast, okay? And so that is the world that we're practicing in. And we don't have good diagnostics for mystery diseases. And frankly, we don't have surveillance for almost any diseases at all. We have very little surveillance. Our surveillance systems are pretty passive. Um, and maybe that's okay if you look at it from an economic perspective. But if you look at how many, like, trillions of dollars that a large pandemic can, can cost, maybe it's not okay. Maybe we could get a little more active or think of new ways to do this. So as a matter of fact, this is uh, northern Uganda, and this was our first outbreak that we responded to on the PREDICT project about four years ago. And, um, and we frankly were, in, we're an arm of a big USAID program. We're called PREDICT, not RESPOND. There's another group called RESPOND. They were supposed to respond. But they were very much involved in setting up the systems in the government to respond. So they did respond to this outbreak, but they don't have, they're about systems more than about science on the field and intervention. So our teams ended up going out to these very, very remote areas. And right before the outbreak occurred, there was an outbreak in pigs. People were told to eat the pigs before they died, just as I said. Nobody ever diagnosed what was going on with those pigs, may or may not have been related. What happened? They tested for the usual suspects, right? Well, first of all, we went out and we talked to the Ministry of Health and they said, we haven't heard from that village. There's not communication out there. So it was just because of people sort of passing by and saying, we think there are problems in this area. So in fact, we said, well, this is where it is. You should go there. They said, we went to the end of the road, didn't find it, turned around, came back. Okay. That because the road didn't go all the way to the village. You had to keep going on a track, not a road. Um, so eventually we helped get together with the Respond folks, help get the, um, the Ministry of Health out there. But by the time everybody's responding, it's months after people have been dying, okay? And my team had to be out there sitting basically on the ground next to a burial mound, next to the hut where the person just died, really thinking about our team's safety, not, not just about what's going on in that village. It's very considered to be dangerous situation, but you don't know because you don't know what it is. So when you test for Ebola and you test, you think, for yellow fever and you test for um, 
for all Shigella, and it takes two weeks to get those samples back into town and some of them sent off. Then you're now months later again, right? And so what this probably was, after the fact, samples that were exported to CDC and went under deep sequencing were positive for yellow fever. They hadn't seen yellow fever in this region for 40 years, so there were no physicians practicing or alive that had ever seen yellow fever in this part of Uganda. And so they discounted yellow fever for two reasons. One, the test came back negative because guess what? The labs hadn't tested for it for 40 years, so they weren't very good at it at the time. The reagents were very good, expired, all of those things. And two, the people weren't yellow because in this part of Africa, it's called yellow fever, but the people don't get yellow. It's just not the variant. It's not what, the way it presents. So, that, so it was taken off the list very early, and people kept going after red herring after red herring. And that's because we are too, I think, um, focused on having one test for one disease. And so that's what we decided was a big part of our obstacle that we needed to address for this particular problem. And so if you can do that, if you can find out what things are circulating that may or may not be pathogens and put them on your watch list and start to prioritize them as to whether or not they're likely to be able to infect people or domestic animals and likely to be able to go pandemic, then you start to have a list of things to watch for. If you can also at the same time improve detection so that you can pick things up even if they aren't something that you've looked for before. So again, a big push for pathology here, but it's just not really happening. People don't jump on. The pathologists in the room, probably this is something you feel like you've been bat battling your head against the wall. It's hard to do the training properly. It takes a very, very bright and well-skilled person to do it well. Um, it takes some equipment, although not that sophisticated of equipment, to do it well. Um, but it's, it's a problem. I think um, we're still working on that, but we can do some better early detection of what's going on um, so that we can hopefully take that big red area and control it faster because it was uh, four months before any control measures were put in in that Uganda example. And, um, and what did they do? They sent vaccine, yellow fever vaccine, to the area, vaccinated, but what was done was done. The outbreak was already over. So now they're vaccinated which is good for the future. But it did it really help this situation? Probably not. So if we look about global vulnerability to zoonotic diseases, if I take you down to Latin America just ever so briefly, contrast four years ago in Uganda with last year in Peru, and actually our team started noticing howler monkeys getting sick, falling out of trees, dead howler monkeys, okay? Luckily we had people in the field that looked for these kinds of things. And with those dead howler monkeys, they were able to use a different kind of diagnostic platform that I'll talk about and identify yellow fever in those howler monkeys. The Ministry of Health immediately jumped on it, rushed out, did a vaccination campaign for the people in those communities for yellow fever, and no people got sick. It, next door in Bolivia, where we did the, the same actual problem, found the same um, pathogen, they didn't vaccinate with that early warning system, and people started to get sick. So, um, so things can get better, but you have to have a lot of different things in place, including government. So we, t we mentioned management. So from a business perspective, that's really important. But government systems are also critically important and how you interact with those. So in the PREDICT project, we've done our homework as well a couple different ways. And um, using different kinds of modeling, we've come up with the most likely suspects, taxa-wise, to carry the next big thing. And those are primates, mostly because they're most closely related to us. And so they af often share things, or we can be infected with things they're infected with, but we may have different disease reactions to those things. Bats, they're the most biodiverse of any of our mammalian species, and they carry thousands and thousands of viruses, and most of those are understudied. And rodents, because historically, they emit many of the pests and plagues have spilled over from rodents because of our close contact with them. We also don't want to discount the others that tend to be things that we interact with a lot. But really, if we do a detailed analysis, both network analysis, retrospective analyses, we keep coming up with, every way we look at it, 
primates, bats, and rodents. So that's where our focus is, because there's only so much money to go around. Um, and what we needed to do, in addition to, to figuring out what samples to take in the field, we needed to figure out how to get them tested. Now, again, in order to sort of um, hone down on what samples to take, we looked at taxa, but we also looked at how to sample an animal. So if you were going to sample a rodent and you were looking for the next big virus, what kind of sample would you take? Blood. Okay, what else might you take? Feces. Okay, what else? A representative sample of everything. How many millions of dollars do you have for testing? No, it's a good, it, I, that would be optimal. The whole animal. So a lot of people kill whole big groups of animals. Wildlife vets, we don't do that. But yes, that has been how it's been done. It, you, you're right, and I don't mean to pick on you because you volunteered, and you're absolutely right. So what else? Saliva, yes, good. Okay, so blood came up first, and whole animal came up in a, in a heavy way, and part of the reason I'm um, focusing on you is that's what's been done historically. Now, I heard feces and saliva. Actually, how would a human get infected from a rodent? Are we going to likely share blood with a rodent? No. We don't even actually normally eat them that much, although there are places that we go where they eat them quite a bit. So meat, tissue, organ, blood, probably much less likely to give us a new viral spillover. Wow. Does that happen in here a lot? <laughs> From your reaction, I guess not. Okay. Um, but saliva, when they chew on our food or they bite us, which actually is much more common than many people think. In some of our villages, 50% of people report being chewed on by rodents at night while they sleep. Um, yes, disgusting, right? Wash your hands before you go to bed. That's the bottom line. They said mostly when they eat fish. So, yikes. Um, okay, but, um, but those interfaces where people interact with animals is how we're going to transmit the majority of pathogens. So feces, if they're pooping in our food, right, they're in our grain, or saliva, great places to start. So, so rectal swabs, nasopharyngeal swabs to get a good sample is a, a good way to go. But then you have to take it somewhere. And so what I wanted to show you here is how do you afford in all of these places in the world, you don't want to be moving the world's deadliest pathogens potentially all over the world, right? That wouldn't be safe. Also, by the way, there are biodiversity compacts. People want to control the genetic material out of their own country so that they can make vaccines and all of those things. So we needed to help build capacity in the countries where we were working. This was a really novel approach by our Tanzanian colleagues. This beautiful laboratory here was built. It's a molecular virology laboratory, fully contained generators, its own ventilation system. That is, that is actually two shipping containers stacked on top of each other. And, um, and then windows popped in, granite countertops and marble floors, I will tell you, for $40,000, including equipment. Okay. That's some ingenuity. I bet you your new building is going to be much different. My, mine was, right, the one we just moved into. So you can do a lot with a little. What you can do, also you can do great science. So you have to do the basics. You have to get laboratory capacity. You have to think about things in a different way. But you can start to figure out how much virus is out there. So as we're sampling bats, this, this is for one, in Bangladesh, one species of bat. We wanted to know what should be our sample size, right? You do your animal use and care protocol. You want to say how, what your legitimate sample size is. Very difficult when you're trying to detect something that no one knows if it exists or not. Right? So it's, it's not a reasonable calculation. But from the microbiologist, from the bacteriologist, we could look at discovery curves and start to think about this. And we could see that once we get above, you know, about 700 samples, we're starting to saturate that curve. So maybe we just want to pick up 80% of the pathogens that might be, or viruses, some of which could become pathogens, in that bat. We're way, way better off if we can get 80%. And to get 100%, we've got to go all the way out here, more than double that sample size. So we get to the law of diminishing returns. So we start to get some good science coming in and start to better the ability of people making surveillance decisions around the world. All right, but we also, not only do we need the right 
sample type for how it's going to, people are going to get infected, the right taxa, a place, to, um, a place to test those samples, but we also need to pick the location. So we do that global, I showed you that zoonotic hotspot map, you know, the global vulnerability to zoonotic diseases. What if where I'm going tonight, Rwanda, the whole map is red, the whole country is red. It lives in a red high, high likelihood place of um, emerging zoonotic diseases. Then you have to get your team, which hopefully is a local team composed of people from that area who are experts in their fields in the area. You have to get that team to say, all right, empirically, where do we think these things are going to emerge? And we have to think about travel routes, trade routes. We have to think about interfaces where people are living more intimately with the animals that they might interact with, places where people are converting land to agriculture land from forest and cutting down the forest, coming into contact with species they might. Places like mines where people are going into a mine, meeting a bat that maybe humans have never seen before or meeting their flora that maybe people have never seen before. Oh, and by the way, when they travel to that remote location where that mine is, they may be bringing chickens and goats and things to eat with them, right? Maybe even some crops. And so what is that going to do? So we look at the high-risk interfaces. So only in those places where we think there is the more risky behavior going on. Not always right, but we can do some good science there too. And so when I, when I do this for USAID, I don't always bring in all the hypothesis-driven stuff, but I know that's how we make our living in academia as well, is that we want to do the good science. So one of our sub-projects is called the Deep Forest Project, and in three countries in our system, so in Uganda, Brazil, and in Sabah, Malaysia, or Borneo, we, um, we have a project called Deep Forest. We have a lot of deeps. We have deep freeze, deep forest, deep clean. It's become some sort of joke within the project. But Deep Forest was the first one named primarily because there's a band that plays a scary song that, um, yeah, it's an interesting team. So that's what happens when you bring together lots of disciplines to solve these kinds of problems. They like to pick songs whatever. So it really is about the relationships and bonding and trusting each other and valuing each other and respecting each other. And you come up with good things. So in this one, we wanted to know how many viruses are out there. That's the overall goal of the project, what they are, what animals carry them, how are people involved with them, and what's the highest risk. And so we wanted to test that biodiversity um, hypothesis. So the hotspots maps that are used now for surveillance are based on human population density and biodiversity. Those are the two drivers. We are about to come out with some new ones with what we think are the same, um, better, but also the same. So there are good reasons why those things predict that, but there are some better um, resolution ones. And we're doing that primarily because here we can look in all the way across gradients from pristine-ish we, call it, we like it to be pristine, but nothing really is pristine anymore, to semi-disturbed and start to convert land for um, agriculture and other practices all the way to urban. So we have a couple places across the grid where we can do that. And when we do that, then we can sample all of the, the species we can get our hands on in those three taxa, primates, rodents, and bats and look at how many viruses they carry. Do they carry more in the pristine habitat? That would go with the biodiversity um, uh, hypothesis, but maybe they carry more when they're mixing with other species in the intermediate zone where land is turning over. Maybe that's really where the dangerous spot is. Or maybe it's when they get into an urban situation and they're sharing more with people even. Um, and there's back and forth an opportunity for resortment. So that's what um, one of the things we're doing right now that's fueling our modeling. We also look at the other interfaces that are maybe a little bit more obvious, subsistence hunting. Um, and so certainly people are encountering all, all kinds of fluids and tissues from these animals and in all kinds of ways, the hunters versus the butcherers versus the consumers versus the sh chefs, cookers, um, as my kids used to say, you're a good cooker. Um, and, and in places like this in Nepal, um, where there's a lot of social change that are bringing new species. So pigs didn't used to be in the capital of Kathmandu. Now there's a huge influx of pigs with the Mao political party coming in to Kathmandu. That's causing mixing with what 
they have in their urban situations that most of us don't have. Free ranging cattle, right? So all the bulls are walking around, um, as well as um, things like monkeys, macaques, as well as even um, leopards, snow leopards come right into Kathmandu. So there's a lot of mixing with people living in these kinds of conditions. Right. So these are the kinds of interfaces that we look at. And I mentioned the extractive industries already. All right, so this is where we're working. This is at the end of year four. We're just uh, at the beginning of year five on the um, uh, federal calendar. And this is the consortium that's US-based leads of the consortium here, although we have in every country a ton of local collaborators, as well as other members of the consortium that maybe just aren't at the sort of executive level. So we're working in 20 countries with 59 ministries in those countries and with people from their universities and all sorts of disciplines, as well as our teams on this end. And we are kind of happy that um, USAID picked a team that um, came in with basically a no-kill policy. So we aren't um, doing it the old-fashioned way of uh, looking for new viruses where you go in and you just kill all the bats in a roost and you look at all of what they have. We're, we're doing it in a conservation way. So um, luckily we had the good science to back up the reason for um, doing uh, the right thing by the wildlife as well as the people and the animals. And this we've talked about. So we do the probabilistic modeling, helps us make that hotspot map that tells us where to go, but it's on such a broad scale that we need to work with the local experts to get us out into the field, do intensive studies. We also respond to outbreaks, as I mentioned, but not just for people, but also for domestic animals and occasionally for wildlife, so getting that better reporting. People have cell phones. My pastoralist friends have two cell phones. Thank you very much. You know, they don't have a car and they don't have a TV, but they definitely have two cell phones. So you can do a lot with um, remote reporting now to get an early detection system. And then the laboratory investigations, that all has to fuel the models to continually refresh the loop and make our surveillance systems better. So as I mentioned, uh, laboratory capacity was a big problem, and it wasn't part of our award, actually. We weren't supposed to do any laboratory capacity building in our program. There was another arm that, that did work on laboratory capacity building, but they had their own agendas that were really good and smart, but they didn't match with us being able to detect any virus. So we had to do our own. So they were going in and improving the labs for things that the countries really needed, like rabies and yellow fever, obviously, and other diseases that were super important to the countries. That was very important also for the countries to be happy that we were there and doing something maybe weirder, um, like our project. But we still couldn't get any of our novel virus detection done in the countries without building the laboratory capacity. And so what we did was we we basically, I call this lessons from the wild, and that was we had to find a low-cost platform. So there are lots of folks around the world, and we do it too, to check our work, that have high-cost platforms, multiplex, deep sequencing. We do all of that, but we don't have enough money to do that in 20 countries in all of those hotspots. And, oh, by the way, those countries don't want to export their samples, and we don't want to really be taking the risk of moving too many samples. We, we do move some for double checking, but we, don't, we want to do it as little as possible. So we went back to the, the table, got the disciplines around the table, the virologists, the diagnosticians, the laboratorians, the human health, animal health workers, um, everybody we could bring in. The management people were important here as well as the folks that run laboratories. And we said, well, what else can we do? So we went back to consensus PCR, so looking at PCR that would be conserved across whole viral families. So then we picked the viral families that we thought were most likely because they had emerged or they had caused an epidemic or definitely if they had caused a pandemic in the past. Just viruses now, that's the, whole, the focus of this project. And so we picked those viral families, and then we either got primers that were already in the literature, or we designed new primers, and we're always optimizing our primer set. And we started training folks the old-fashioned way to do PCR, so less kit-based and back to I really understand how to do this and what the machine is doing and what I am doing so that when it doesn't work, they can troubleshoot it. And that actually has proven to be quite illuminating because most people don't do that anymore. In wildlife health, 
that's what we do. There are no tests really developed and marketed for wildlife. So we always have to sort of do things from scratch instead of by mix with the, the cake baking analogy. And so we went back to that um, for a lot of these viral families. And I, this says 20 PCR protocols. We actually have about 30 now that we run because in some of the viral families, there's enough divergence that we need to run more than one um, PCR protocol. And we had to get control material. And that can be very expensive and very dangerous. Again, you don't want to have positive Ebola control in every laboratory that may be just building their first molecular lab, right? So we synthesized control material. So this is our control one. We actually have three universal controls for our predict testing. And um, so we can put that, um, that positive control material into a plasmid and run it on PCR for positive controls. And it has a little, um, you know, lab geeky tag on it that says predict so that we can also detect um, contamination. And the, the great thing about this control material is it's nice to have it available so that you can optimize your test. The bad thing about a plasmid control is it's an aggressive little bugger and it will contaminate the labs and almost all the labs have experience contamination. That also, though, is a good lesson learned because then they learn how not to do it anymore, including in my own lab when a student assistant contaminated the whole lab. Um, but, you know, not to flick caps and um, have good laboratory practices and good cleanliness and all of those things. So I think we're all better off for it. But the bottom line is, felt like it was taking us a really long time to be able to do what we were supposed to do. So we could go out and get the samples. We could think about and collect them in the right way from the right places, with the right, but could we get them tested? And so we're now in the fifth year of this five-year project, and, um, and that's where we are. This, this slide, unfortunately, it's actually 33, 35 labs now we're working with, but these are about right. So we have it, all 35 labs have experienced some training. About 28 of those can run at least, can extract um, uh, RNA and make cDNA. Um, and run one or two protocols. So once they get one under their belt, then they very rapidly expand. And then in 20 countries, um, we've got multiple PCR protocols being run now. So we're, I think we're doing pretty well in just four years. Those are, again, many of them are national labs. Some of them are university labs. Um, often the, na the national lab doesn't want to do this kind of work because they can't, they don't even have the capacity yet to run the kits for rabies, like I mentioned, something that's really important to them. So they let us spin off to the research labs because they think it's more of a new thing that can be developed, optimized, and then spun back to them. We're also doing human surveillance in all of our um, places, often together with other partners like CDC that may be working in the country, but sometimes um, just with our own people. And we do a combination of approaches uh, including in outbreak investigations, adding a human-animal contact questionnaire to the regular kind of outbreak investigations. Um, and um, sometimes if we aren't going fast enough during outbreaks, we do go directly to deep sequencing, which um, resulted for this one in DRC for us uh, discovering a new rhabdovirus that was causing a hemorrhagic disease, which is very strange um, for a rhabdovirus. So, um, so we have been able to detect... Um, new viruses causing human um, disease as well as others. And I'll go over that in just a minute. So really what this is about is preparing the countries to respond better and thinking about a new way to do the testing so that when it does come up negative, that first round on all the usual suspects, they have another way to go. And in fact, in some situations like the H7N9 situation, we used our platform next to the WHO rapidly developed protocol to compare and contrast the cost and the number of viruses that we would find. Um, and we picked up all the H7N9s that the H7N9 protocol was picking up, but we also picked up nine other influenzas in the same sample set that could be combining with that H7N9 and potentially creating a new flu. Um, and so if you just test for the one thing that's happening at the time, you tend to miss um, those kinds of opportunities. Then we have to get all of the 
the test results approved by the government for release. So we have a, um, a public um, ethos where we, we will put all of our information in the public demand, in domain, but some of the countries need to have a little more control and approve of the release before they do that, and they do. And so um, we've partnered with Harvard and HealthMap to get all of our data online. Right now, all the surveillance data is up, so if you go to, well, we prefer if you go in through our UC Davis Predict site and click on the map um, that says surveillance, and it will take you here, or you can go to healthmap.org slash predict, and that will take you to our site. You can turn the hotspot map layer on and off. That gives you the pretty colored backgrounds. And then you can turn the surveillance layer on and off. And that will show you where we're sampling and how many different sample sites we have in all the different regions. If you zoom in, it will go all the way to the local um, spot. And then you can turn on and off. This is new. Um, but anyway, our um, test results. So the test results, a new layer. So the only test results up there are the ones that have been approved by the governments. But we do have um, quite a lot of results up if you want to go and check out the different viruses we're finding, the little bit of public interpretation of those viruses, what kind of sample type and interface they come from. And then if they've already been published by the country or by us um, or they're not or we're not planning on publishing them. There's also a link directly into GenBank, and you can get the whole sequence. And that's resulted in a lot of good science. We had a Nature paper um, just the end of last year following up on SARS. Um, so 10 years later, we don't want it to take 10 years for us to be finding the hosts of these viruses. But we were able to, with our Chinese colleagues in the league, in the lead for the project, actually find um, an, a, a, an ACE2 receptor SARS-like coronavirus identical to SARS that can likely go directly into humans, um, and as opposed to having to go through some other mammalian host, which was the previous hypothesis. So that's the big picture. Um, and that's, again, our, our hotspot map. Um, and it's an iterative strategy, so we're targeting all of those things that I mentioned, getting the informatics and reporting out. And what we've been able to do is train about 2,500 colleagues in the different countries. There's 20 countries now. It was a few more. We had a few more Latin American countries in the beginning. Again, working with 59 ministries. We sampled over 50,000 animals, and from many of them taken anywhere from three to nine samples, but we don't test all those samples. We bank a lot of them so that if we need to go back and figure out what, what all the... We've discovered 250 novel viruses to date, um, as well as a whole cohort of known viruses. We didn't discover those, but we identified them. So our platform lets us pick up knowns and unknowns at the same time. So we think it's actually more cost efficient to do it that way. The biggest thing is we're not just looking for one thing at a time. We're looking for many things at the same time so that we can hopefully not miss and delay the diagnosis. Um, and as I mentioned, we've documented human pathogens um, th that have come from animal origin, and they're causing illness and death, or they're just infecting people, maybe not causing anything, then maybe they're not a pathogen. But also, we've uh, identified the other kind of spillover from people into endangered mountain gorillas, for example, where the mountain gorillas are dying of human metanuma virus, of herpes simplex virus. So we, we have been um, identifying that spillover both ways. That's it. Question? Yes, ma'am. Oh, you have to carry it? Yep. Oh, oh, I thought that one doesn't work. Only for, Only for them. I see. Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, John. <laughs> so no sampling from insects, huh? It's just light is on. I think, yeah. Uh, so now we can get into politics. Do we have any political scientists in here? So uh, vector-borne disease, that's a question or a political scientist? Okay, hold on. <laughs> um, so uh, a couple different things. One is we feel like, and USA did this before, made the decision before our input, but we've done, as I mentioned, those network analyses I'm not showing here today, but um, 
where the, the vector borne diseases are actually clustering really well amongst themselves in the way that those interfaces work. Um, and so we wanted to study those things that were understudied, whereas a lot more people are working on the, um, the vector borne. In addition, we are one project, as I mentioned, in the EPT program. USAID also funds CDC, and their expertise is much, much more heavily influenced than in the vector borne. So it was covered, basically. So occasionally when there are outbreaks, we do collect insects, but there's another deficiency that's going on in the countries, and that's uh, people don't want to be entomologists anymore as much, which is a problem. So basic entomology, just like pathology, is a big deficiency in a lot of places where so, uh, like a few years back, like four or five years back, when I was working in a field, so uh, the the I have I got, I got a situation on there. Uh, so we are we are having uh, blue. T so so uh, uh, I think the vets here you know that blue tongue disease, which we mainly f uh, like find in the sheep. So we are having a lot of prevalence in specific areas in the goats. So. We have, uh, so in India, there is very less, I mean, government is really, really less interested in the lab investigation and all. So we, we tried to put it like, uh, we, we, we have tried to do the genotyping w from the patient, like from the animals, what we were getting. And we, we were suspecting, like we are a group of doctors over there, like three, four doctors, and we were suspecting that that genotype is different from the, 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 like, the sheep and the goat. But, you know, like nobody was so much interested with that. And ultimately it was like nothing, nothing happened. Yeah. So my question is how do you approach these kind of problems? Like it's, it's kind of field problem and you need, to, you need to trust the field doctors who is day-to-day -day affecting, day-to-day -day facing these kind of problems. And it, it has a potential and substantial, you know, the gap between the doctors and the researchers. So how do we approach that problem? Absolutely. Thank you. And I think um, one of the things I didn't have time to talk about the other projects that much, but the RESPOND project has done two big areas of activity. One I mentioned was helping the countries get ready for proactively think about response. The other one is One Health Education, and so that's something you all are obviously doing here in a major way, um, and I applaud you for it, but they're, they're putting in One Health Education into the streams uh, of the public health schools, the medical schools, and the veterinary schools. And and um, so that's, again, just in a suite of countries, but that will hopefully provide proof of concept uh, from an educational perspective of people being more open to these concepts when they get out into the field or when they become the minister of uh, livestock or whatever. So I think it has to start and move its way through, and that takes a long time, unfortunately. But with projects on the science like this, we've had, the, again, the proof of concept help um, by being able to be really productive and get that information out. Again, I, another example along that line was Peru. Um, recently, they had a big hantavirus outbreak. And when we originally collected the samples and were working with the labs, they were a little slow, didn't really get all the testing done. Then when they had a hantavirus outbreak, they started using our teams, our protocols, and they said, oh my goodness, we have to go finish testing all of those samples that you put into our freezers. Um, we'll get that done now. In fact, they used all the rodent samples to test for hanta, but also um, everything else. So I think it's a slow process, but I, I think the world is changing. I hope so, anyway. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Uh, I have a specific question. Uh, do you, are you concerned that if you try to repeat the study two years from now, your data sets may be slightly different because of climate change and people change and everything. So how reliable is this finding across time frames, like five years, ten years? Uh, so I'm not concerned. I expect it to be different. Um, so it's just a starting point. And USAID's perspective is that this is a 20-year program to help target and um, drive the science of surveillance in a, in a new direction. So we expect that. And so we're looking at those drivers that I mentioned. All I talked about today was the biodiversity 
um, hypothesis, but we and they and others uh, with other funding are looking at all those hypotheses, and we expect them to be different. If if they didn't evolve, we wouldn't keep getting new diseases. So, um, so I think that's fine. Um, we're about to finish, and so we're always concerned about sustainability, and we have a couple little um, hints at what might be good. But I, my big concern that keeps me up is how do I take those 250 and prioritize them and say which ones are the ones that should go into the research labs, which ones are the ones we should hammer on NIH to fund more virologic studies on. Um, how do I make that list smaller? Because as we made the world a little smaller to find these, we now f still found a lot, and we need to make that list a little smaller. We will be bidding and competing for the next five years, and um, I think they were pretty happy with the work we did because they raised the ceiling from $75 million to $100 million for the next five years. So I think they're on board that this is worth doing and that, um, and that whoever wins that bid needs to do more of the basic virology that we did not have the leeway or scope to do in this first one. When there's an outbreak of anything like Ebola or influenza, of course, CDC sends in teams, and CDC can be a little bit territorial, let's say, to be nice about it. Uh, how do you coordinate with them so you don't either duplicate or step on each other's toes? That's always challenging, and in any outbreak situation, there's chaos. So the biggest thing, and what I didn't mention in Uganda, so in year one, you saw that it was pretty hectic and a little ridiculous, months to get out there, all of those things. Then everybody came at the same time. Then everybody's trying to find the answer. So what we see now in Uganda uh, is that, again, through all the collaborators, but I think we had a, a big role in that, there is a proactive emergency response plan. Or just four years ago in Uganda, you, they would not release any governmental funds to try to um, respond to the outbreak until you knew what it was because they had their silos of, well, this should come from the Ebola pot and this should come from the whatever pot. And so because it was undiagnosed, they couldn't release any money for the Ministry of Health people to even go out. That is all gone. They have a whole zoonotic team and an ecologic team on their task force for zoonoses, for, on their task force for emergency disease response, which they didn't even have the task force. Our people, because we work with local people, our team members are on those task force. So they're now contacted within an hour of the outbreak becoming known, either to the government. And those um, task force are meeting within 24 hours and getting people out field. So it may be us or it may not, but it's the right people because the right people are there discussing it and then they call in CDC or WHO or whoever they call in. So it's much more integrated. Uh, the approach is very much like the old arbovirus program by the Rockefeller Foundation back in the 60s and 70s. But this is a, sorry. <laughs> But what you've done, and by the way, an excellent presentation, is to ramp this up at the international level where it really needed to be. It would seem that the next step would actually be to go to predicting where the outbreaks are going to occur once you build the databases, integrate them. If you could do that, then I think you've really got something that's uh, it's going to be useful for the entire world, whether you live in an urban area or whether you live in way out in the middle of nowhere. That's obviously the goal. Yep. So, um, but it won't be just us, our consortium, right? This, again, it's a One Health problem. It requires software developers. It requires all sorts of remote sensing people. And so we're starting that work now. We have about 11 models, predictive models, that we're testing out. Basically testing them out on retrospective data and then waiting to see if they fit and predict what, what does come next. Um, but certainly the White House, Office of Science and Technology, the Department of Defense, CDC have just launched and changed their global health initiative to start to go in this direction. And the White House's initiative, they're looking at it as sort of the National Weather Service for pandemic and epidemic prediction. But when we had the first meeting of that group, um, their, uh, their, the weather service people there said, you have to realize it took 50 years to collect the background data before we had one model that did anything good. And this is what I keep trying to say, is that there is no surveillance. So we can do this in a focal way over a few years, but there is no surveillance for these kinds of things. So how can we predict if there's no surveillance? You know? So um, we have to invest on in the surveillance side. 
Um, very impressive work. A uh, number of years ago, uh, I think uh, DOD, specifically DARPA, had launched a uh, program where I think the name was, program name was more sensational, I think, than your the name was uh, Prophecy. I read the original uh, RFP, but really haven't uh, heard about it. But I think their goal was also sort of somewhat similar, you know, predict the emergence of the uh, next, you know, next, next big threat. Uh, have you kind of heard about like yeah, sure. what what happened and after all that? Of our work builds upon Rockefeller and Prophecy. Actually, um, my partner on the human health side from uh, Columbia University worked as a lead for DARPA. Um, so uh, we certainly are building on that. And the reason I bring up the stamp collecting is that's been a big um, controversy or a big, um, I guess, uh, criticism of our program. Is well, Rockefeller did that made a list. Why do we need another list? It's just stamp collecting. Well, we're trying to do it hopefully as well as they did, but then even better yet, looking at the right sample type, looking at the right interfaces, trying to see where there's the likelihood of that spillover versus just we can go find probably thousands of viruses. I'm only interested in the ones that are likely to make people sick. People have to then be coming into contact with them in certain situations. So that's where I think we're doing it a little bit differently. But all the work builds on the work before it. And 20 years from now, some different people will be sitting in a room like this and saying how they're doing it better, I hope, then we'll be successful. It's just uh, one more uh, quick question. So you mentioned about surveillance. So based on your, I guess, your understanding now, uh, can you, you know, for example, put together a recommendation of how or what kind of surveillance network is needed? And of course, you, you want everything, but consider cost, what would be the most efficient way to build a surveillance network? So I, th I think we need to be looking at the appropriate interfaces in the right countries. So in China and its neighbors, we need to be looking at the value chain for poultry, for example, because um, a lot of different species are coming into that value chain, and we've seen a lot of spillover out of it. So instead of just saying we need to look at every border crossing and, and every farm across the country, we need to focus surveillance more specifically where we can to optimize resources. But then when we do look more broadly, we need to look more broadly, not just at one or two or three things. We need to figure out platforms that can in a cost-efficient way, um, figure out what's out there so that we know what we're looking for. So that's just the little bit beginning of um, how we start to optimize it. And then things like getting the right sample sizes and, um, and getting the right preservation techniques and improving cold chains. And there are so many surveillance recommendations. We actually are making a book. Any other questions? If not... Thank you so much.